So I'm going to speak about generative adversarial networks, particularly for the problem of image-to-image uh, -image translation. Okay. So a generative adversarial network or GANs are par uh, part of a family of models called uh, generative models. And the idea behind generative models is one that you want, given the training data, uh, you want to um, produce the density estimation of this uh, training data, but maybe this uh, training data, for example, images, lives in a very high dimensional manifold, uh, so it's not very possible to um, implicitly write the probability density function, or even implicitly uh, have this probability density function. So what we want to do is to estimate, during some sort of a neural network, uh, this density function uh, in order to sample efficiently uh, from the distribution of the training data. Uh, another property of um, generative models, and particularly GANs, and that's where GANs are particularly good at, is sample generation. So on the left, you have um, some sort of training data called Celeb A, which is simply images of faces. And uh, the property that we want of our generator is to generate realistically looking uh, images, which have never been uh, seen before, not part of the training data. So the left part, um, the model here, is um, um, called progressive GAN, and uh, you can see that images uh, produced are being very realistic uh, with generative adversarial networks. So what, that, what is a generative adversarial network? A generative adversarial network consists of two networks, a generator and a discriminator. The role of the generator is to uh, give in some input uh, noise Z, Z, which you can think of as the source of randomness, is to produce realistically looking uh, images from the dis training distribution. And the role of the discriminator is to distinguish between um, real samples from the training data and fake samples generated by the generator. So in particular, D tries to uh, take a real sample X and classify it as one, being real, and uh, take samples generated by G and classify them as zero, being fake. So, and what D tr and G tries to do is to fool the discriminator. That means it tries to produce images, G of Z, such that D uh, thinks uh, to be uh, real. That means G tries to push D of G of Z to be as close to one as possible. So this process happens iteratively. G and D train together, each with these opposing objectives, and this way the generator becomes better and better at producing more realistic images, and the discriminator uh, becomes better and better at producing a distinction between real images and fake, generated, fake uh, images generated by the generator. Um, so one extension which is very important for, for GAN is that of a conditional GAN. So instead of giving some random vector Z, we can uh, give it as an input some uh, input image X. In this, for, in this example, uh, we have uh, an ed image of an edge we'd want to produce a realistic looking uh, shoe that matches that edge. So the input of the generator is the edge image, the generator produces a shoe, and the discriminator tries to distinguish between a realistic looking sh real shoe and a shoe generated by the generator, and it's additionally given the uh, condition, conditional image uh, that it started with. So this leads me to the uh, main topic of the talk, and that is uh, image-to-image -image translation. And all of these methods that you'll see are using this conditional GAN framework. Okay? So uh, what is an image-to-image -image translation? An image-to-image -image translation, we're given two sets of uh, images, uh, domain A and domain B. Uh, so for example, and um, you may be given images of horses and images of zebras. And the task is given an image of a horse, generate an analogous image of a zebra, um, in the target. So here you can see multiple other domains uh, translating between images taken in the summer to images in the winter and uh, translating with different styles and many other, uh, many other tasks. Um, here are a few other examples uh, where we want to translate between uh, images of handbags to images of shoes. Uh, so you can see that it keeps the same color and texture um, translate between blonde hair people to uh, black hair, etc. So um, now 
these approaches doing image administration can be roughly divided into four categories. The first category is the supervised approaches. And in the supervised approaches, we are given in training the matching pair from uh, the, the, the data set A and data set B. So for example, if we are translated in between uh, edges to shoes, uh, during training, we are given the edge and the shoe that corresponds to that edge. In the unsupervised approach, no matching pairs are given during training. So we are simply given a collection of edges, a collection of shoes, and we are asked at test time, given an edge, to produce the matching shoe. Another distinction is between unimodal and multimodal approaches. So um, you can imagine that given an edge, uh, there are multiple types of shoes that we can produce, different in color, different in texture, and we'd like to capture the idea of getting a variety of different outputs um, when translating. So um, here is an it, another view of that uh, unsupervised versus uh, supervised approach. So in the supervised approach, we're given an edge and a matching image of the cat. And in the out pair approach, we're simply given a collection of horses, a collection of zebras, and we're asked to do this translation. So the first approach uh, which is, uh, that came out is the, a unimodal supervised approach called picks to picks. So we have a conditional generator that uh, ensures that we are able to um, generate an image in the target distribution. So for example, here we are given a grayscale images and um, a matching colored image. But using a conditional generator is not enough because it may produce a colored image which is not matching uh, to the input that you started with. So what pix 2 pix does is in addition, well, in addition to the gun loss, the conditional gun loss, as an L1 loss between the generated image and the target image. Okay? So this way, the conditional gun ensures that we generate con correctly from the target distribution and the L1 loss ensures that there is a matching between the produced image and the target. So here are a few examples produced by this method. Um, you can do uh, segmentation maps to, the, to, to images, uh, facade labels to uh, facades, uh, background images to color, day to night um, translation, um, and many other translations. So what happens now if you don't have these matching pairs during training, can you still do, uh, produce a valid translation? So uh, the, the main techniques uh, use, the most popular techniques used here is those of circular guns. You may be familiar with cycle gun, um, but there are three papers that came out that uh, apart from architectural uh, changes, they do exactly the same. So the idea is very simple. If I take an uh, image uh, in domain X and I translate it to domain Y, and now I translate it back, this image, and say it back to domain, to domain X, then I should get back the same image that I started with, right? But I also have to ensure that um, I correctly generate from the target distribution, and I s simply do that using uh, the GAN loss on G and F. So if G translates from domain X to Y, and F translates from Y to, to X, then I have a gun loss on uh, G and F to ensure that G translates an uh, image of a zebra and F translates an image of a horse. And I additionally have a reconstruction loss, uh, which means that G of F of Y is as close to Y as possible, and F of G of X is as close to X as possible. So here are just a few samples uh, generated by cycle gun. This is just a uh, style transfer um, examples, but there are many others. Um, another approach to, uh, to do this translation in an unsupervised way is to ensure um, if I take two images um, of in, the, in, the, in domain A, I want to ensure that after translation, the distance between them is roughly preserved, okay? So you can see here, um, if I take two images of a uh, horse and I translate them to zebras, then the distance between the horses should be uh, highly correlated within the distance to the zebras. And on the left side, uh, I show you a diagram where um, you can see the, the on the x-axis, we have the distances between two randomly chosen horses. On the y-axis, we have the distance between the matching uh, pairs of, of zebras. 
And you can see that there's very high correlation between the distances. So, um, so I've talked so far about the unsupervised and the supervised unimodal approach. It turns out that we can have even less supervision than, than that. So what happens if I have just a single image in domain A and I still have multiple of images in domain B? So for example, in this example, I have um, a label of a facade here, and in domain B I have multiple uh, multitude of images of facades which are not matching, okay? And can I, trans can I generate the matching image to, to X in domain B just with the single image? Well, it turns out that yes, you can. And the idea is here is as follows. You train an autoencoder for domain B, and the autoencoder here, since we have many images in domain B, uh, we can efficiently train an autoencoder. And then we take the lower layers of the encoder and lower layers of the decoder, and we fix them from the autoencoder trained on domain B. And then using just the single image that uh, we have from domain A, we fine-tune the, out the outer layers of this autoencoder using a gun loss, okay, as well as a few other losses. Uh, but the gun loss ensures that given this image here, I can efficiently generate from the target distribution. So here, if you, you see a, little, a few compa uh, comparisons of this approach, uh, the input uh, is on the left column, and the column just beside that shows you um, the uh, result of the one-shot translation. And cycle gun and unit, uh, if you know it, they don't do very well when you just have one single image in the, uh, in, in the first domain. So, um, what happens now if you want to generate um, a variety of outputs? So, for example, you have a, a label image and you want to generate a variety of facades, right? You, you have an image in domain A and um, there are multiple output, matching outputs that y you can produce. Uh, what's, what, what can you do? So, um, there are two supervised approaches that came out. One is called a uh, MADGAN and uh, the second is bicycle gun. And the idea of MADGAN is that I have two generators, okay? Uh, one producing, uh, given an, an edge image, I, the first generator produce, uh, knows how to produce a bag, the second generator also knows how to produce a bag. For example, you can use cycle gun, okay? And we additionally employ another loss, which is an L1 loss between the outputs of the two generators. So the two generators try to maximize the distance between them while still producing valid aligned mappings, for example, using cycle gun. It doesn't matter which unsupervised pros here you use for the generator, as long as you add additionally the L1 loss between the outputs of the generators. Another approach is that of uh, bicycle gun. And what bicycle gun tries to do is uh, inject some noise Z into the generator. But it's not enough just to t inject some noise into the generator, because this alone the generator will just ignore. What happens, in additionally, is that you have to be able to uh, reconstruct that noise from the generated image G of X. So that noise will somehow be encoded in G of X, and question, you, you train an additional encoder from G of X in order to reconstruct the noise that you injected into the image. So this is a, a supervised approach. And um, when M -unit, uh, an M unit called, uh, which is mute, Multimodal unsupervised image-to-image -image, uh, translation is an unsupervised approach to produce um, multiple of outputs, but we want the variety of outputs to be in, in style. So we have different styles of outputs, and the way they do it is uh, as follows. Uh, given uh, we have two domains, x1 and x2, and we want to encode an image x into uh, uh, two vectors. The first vector is a vector that represents the content of the image, and the second vector is a vector that represents the style of the image. Okay? So um, they have um, a sp very specific architecture for the content encoder and the style encoder. Uh, for the content encoder, they use uh, ResNet connections as well as down sampling layers. And for the um, style generator, they use what, what um, 
something called adaptive instance normalization, which is a particular, uh, is a particular technique to extract the style uh, out of the image. Okay? You can think of uh, um, techniques like using the gram matrix or maybe uh, something else, but this is just a very uh, good technique to extract the style of the image. And they employ a multitude of uh, losses. So, for example, um, if we just wanted to auto-encode uh, our image from the content and style vectors, then we'll just apply, um, um, we'll just have an auto-encoder, right? That um, the encoder um, generates both the content and the style, and the decoder takes a concatenation of the content and the style vectors and is able to reconstruct the image. But what we do here instead is that we um, take the image from the main X, we produce the two, content vec uh, the two vectors, the content vector and the style vector, and now we use a conditional GAN to take this content vector and the style vector in order to produce image from the target uh, distribution. Okay. So here are a few samples. If we get uh, an input which is an edge image, we can in fact produce a variety of uh, different colors uh, for the same image, uh, for the shoe image, or variety of image, uh, variety of outputs for the uh, handbags. Okay. Uh, they are also able to do very good uh, translations for animals. So, for example, uh, translating between a cat image and uh, dogs, or uh, house cats to dogs. So you can see how they manage to produce variety of dogs, and what they did here is that they took the same content vector of that input image that they started with, but they used different style vectors from different images. They could even interpolate within the style vectors between two images or randomly sample um, a style vector and produce a variety of different styles uh, from the same content. So, um, what I described here is uh, a method where you want to produce a variety of different styles, um, but it turns out that what happens if the variation is not in style but in content, okay? So, in here in the, the uh, layer at the top, uh, we have uh, data sets cons uh, consisting of uh, faces, uh, image faces, and um, on the right, on the, the left column, uh, we have a data set of images with, uh, with glasses, right? And we, might be, we may want to transfer a particular set of glasses, okay? Maybe the, 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 you know, maybe it's a sunglasses or uh, eyeglasses or uh, slightly uh, bigger uh, sunglasses. And we want to be able to transfer that a particular set of uh, eyeglasses uh, to the image on the top. So the technique here is able to, in fact, uh, transfer the eyeglasses from the uh, from the images on the left column to the images um, on the on the top. So how how do we do this? Um, the idea is as follows: uh, If we have an image, uh, we have a multiple of losses, okay, and we have two types of encoder. Um, we have encoder for the separate. Uh, separate features and encoder for the common features. So, for example, if we have a uh, data set of uh, image of faces and data set of faces with, with glasses, uh, we want the separate encoder to, to encode only the glass information and the common encoder to encode only the face information. And we employ a multiple of losses. The first is that I should be able to uh, reconstruct the original image that I started with given the separate information and the common content information, okay? And another one is if, if I, for the separate encoder, um, if I use the, uh, if I apply the separate encoder which encodes just the glasses on the image of the face, then this should be, this should be the information content should be zero here because there's no glasses in, in any of, of those images, okay? And the last loss, I think, is, is where um, the GAN framework uh, comes in, okay? And that's, I think, is very important because the, here is another way to uh, apply the adversarial loss or the, the GAN loss that I've talked about. Uh, here we apply the GAN loss in the embedding space, the feature space, and not in the pixel space before, 
okay? So uh, the, the role of the common encoder is to encode features which are independent of the glasses information, which encode just the face information, okay? So uh, we train a discriminator, which essentially is the same as a classifier, okay? Uh, the, tr the classifier tries to distinguish between which domain the features came from. Did they come from the features from the domain with glasses or did they come from uh, the domain without glasses, okay? And the encoder tries to fool the discriminator. That means it tries to produce features which are indistinguishable from each other, right? The discriminator has become better and better at distinguishing the features that came from the glasses and non-glasses, and the encoder is becoming better and better at producing features which are undistinguishable for the discriminator. Okay, so here's another way to apply the adversarial laws. So, um, I've talked about the, the, the unsupervised and supervised approaches, as well as the uh, unimodal and multimodal approaches. Um, does this uh, limit ourselves just to the domain of uh, images? Uh, well, in fact, um, in fact, no. It, it works as well, very well in, for example, in the domain of uh, audio separation. And in the domain of audio separation, what we had is we uh, had a, uh, many samples of uh, mixed samples that had background noise and a voice voice uh, information on as a, as a data set A, and as a B just considered just uh, considered of the back, uh, background noise, but these samples were not matching to each other. Okay, so um, we use this this kinds of method in order to be able to um, give an um, mixed sample, generate uh, and uh, remove the background noise and only produce the um, the voice information without the background. Um, so I won't go into too much detail of uh, exactly how that it works, but uh, the same techniques that I talked about can be used. And uh, in particular, what we use here is that um, I can subtract from if if I get the, the I can subtract from the mix sample. If I have the corresponding background, I can subtract it directly in pixel space in order to get the voice information. Um, another domain where uh, this is, uh, was found to be useful is uh, video to video. So uh, the conditional GAN framework is also very useful here. The idea is that uh, I want to generate the um, here, for example, I have a segmentation, um, a video of segmentation uh, frames, and I want to generate the corresponding, uh, you know, uh, video. So they use a GAN in order to, a conditional GAN, in order to take uh, a set of frames uh, that, a set of frames that appeared so far uh, as the condition to the, uh, to the GAN, and um, that conditional GAN took this set of frames and produce, its role was to produce the next frame, okay? So, um, so this, this part was done in exactly the, the, the way I've shown before, okay? But um, you can in additionally encode addition, give additional information to the generator uh, in order to produce, uh, to encode additional information that you have in this domain. So here uh, they chose to encode the time information in, in the video in uh, using optimal flow. And that was an input to the conditional generator that was used in order to get more realistic uh, frames. And um, so I guess the lesson from this is not that the condition to the generator doesn't have to be just a single image or a collection of images, but can also be time, uh, some time information, okay? So, um, the application of conditional GANs or um, image to image translation goes uh, beyond just the methods that I've described, I've described here. Uh, GANs are very useful in order to do uh, photo enhancements, image dehazing, and in many other applications as well, such as uh, medical imaging and biology, uh, voice conversion, cryptography, robotics. Uh, in unsupervised machine translation, it's sometimes difficult to have a generator operate directly on 
on the words themselves because uh, generating discrete data is difficult uh, for GANs. But that's exactly where the adversarial framework on the embedding space is very useful. And there's been few approaches that uh, manage to unsupervise machine translation by employing an adversarial loss on the embedding itself. So uh, that's that. Thank you.